I walked down the aisle to somewhere over the rainbow. And everybody in the room was like, the whole church was like, <laughs> oh my god. I can't they did this. <laughs> Marriage is not about sex. Sex is about sex. Marriage is about something more. It's about a commitment to a person, literally as the vows say in sickness and health, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor. We did not know that we would get the sickness worse and poorer right away. At no point before the wedding did it occur to me that I was anything at that point but bisexual because how could a lesbian be in love with and marrying a man unless she was bi? So I revised my view of my world and I figured, oh, I must be bi and I guess he's not gay because he loves me too. And we had only kissed twice <laughs> in that long courtship, only kissed twice, never had sex, just kissed each other twice. And once, once when he asked me to marry him, and uh, one other time when we were getting married in the church. <laughs> it took us about three days into the honeymoon to discover that, no, nope, Dennis and I were definitely not by. I was still a lesbian, and he was probably gay, but we love each other, and life is what it is, and the heart knows no reason, and you marry who you marry, and you love who you love, and there's no way to understand that. So when I first got really sick with this disease, it was just a few months after we had become married. I fell asleep and I woke up weeks later in the hospital. They did a series of very specific tests and they were able to come to me and say, we know exactly what's wrong with you. You have a type of muscular dystrophy called mitochondrial myopathy. Have you ever done a physical thing and were really exhausted afterward, but then did it some more and got your second wind. Mm -hmm. I don't get that second wind, ever, doing anything. All the money we have been saving, hoping to buy a house, and start a family, and live a wonderful life, pursue our art, got eaten up by hospitals and doctor bills. We were still, you know, a young, newly married couple with all the hopes and dreams you might have. And I thought, well, I'll go to a gynecologist and see if I can get pregnant. And he was very quick in his exam. He walked out of the room and then came back with two other doctors and they had another peek. <laughs> and by this time I'm wondering, oh God, what's seriously wrong with me? because I had no one else to compare it to. I was an only child. I didn't know that my anatomy differed in any substantial way from anyone else's anatomy. And then they eventually did ultrasounds and discovered that I had the genitalia of both a guy and a gal. They called it intersex. During gestation, we know now, when my body was trying to convert testosterone into genitals, it couldn't do that. That was an amount of energy it did not have. And so it stopped halfway. And so here I am, an intersex person stuck halfway between male and female. I was devastated that we couldn't have kids. Yeah. But I was more devastated that the doctor said, you're probably only going to live for about maybe three more years. Yeah, we, that definitely threw us into a tailspin of depression and, and frustration and anger. anger.
the thing I always I always tell people is is that if you're going to get married, marry your best friend. You, while you're caring for someone, you're caring for yourself. You know, we, like a lot of we do everything together. We're best friends, so we do, you know, whatever we're going to do. If, um, if I need a day to go out and just, I want to go sit somewhere and draw, I'll say, why don't we get your art supplies? Let's go to, let's go to Peterborough. There's a little park there, and we, we often will go to Peterborough and sit there and just sketch and draw. She'll take photographs and, and work on stuff. So it's like taking care of her is taking care of me. They kind, they kind of happen together. So we just sort of developed where I was just doing the stuff that needed to be done. And whenever, and I could sit there and do my artwork and draw and write while she was, while I was home, while I was with her. Uh, sometimes I have to help her get dressed. If she's having a really bad day, I may have to cut the food up so that she doesn't have to use a knife and a fork to try to cut things. Um, and on other days, she'll be feeling a lot better. And one thing I've learned is you don't try to do something for somebody who doesn't need it de done today because it takes away their self-worth to feel like that someone's doing something so you got to pull back sometimes and say i know i want i could do it faster she wants to do it let her do it my work has changed drastically because of my vision my vision is not what it was so i've had to progressively work smaller and smaller and smaller Eventually, I'll be painting on pieces of rice. <laughs> no, I won't. But it, it does make a great challenge. Life is nothing if not an interesting adventure. But I did not want my story to be about the sad things. I wanted my story to be about my artwork about me as a person, not me as a disabled person. I am not my disease. My disease is not who I am. I am the person inhabiting the body that has this disease. It has taken Dennis and I some time to discover the plain and simple truth that one day age and gravity will conspire against you. Your soft and lovely loose parts will sag and wrinkle. You will become shaped differently. Your body will fatigue easily. Your life will change. You will become like me. And when you do, remember that that doesn't stop you from being who you are. We always have a theory, a, 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 a philosophy that, you know, I ask Linda in the morning, are you up to going out today? And if she's up to going out, we go out. You know, maybe we'll just go into go around to some antique shops or old bookstores or go to a cafe and have, have something to drink or something. Don't leave it. Do it now because you don't know. And if there is a tomorrow, you can do something else tomorrow. But you won't be looking back saying we didn't do what we really wanted to do. We we are we didn't give up our pleasures, you know, our joy. Part of it is she is like so tenacious <laughs> and thick-headed and stubborn that you know just the fact that they t gave her such a short uh lifespan prognosis she was going to prove them wrong um that's kind of one of her things she loves pro proving everybody wrong um but also she has a love of life that like most people don't have When, when we were driving up to northern Vermont on our honeymoon, 32, and then some years ago, we were lamenting the fact that, although it was the most perfect wedding ever, it was a beautiful clear day and we didn't have a real rainbow in the sky. 
As we're driving in northern Vermont, and we still kept our wedding clothes on, bridal veil, gown, all of it, because we figured we're only going to wear it once. Might as well wear it. I suddenly said, Dennis, pull over to the side of the road now. What's wrong? Just do it. He pulls off to the side of the highway, and everyone else is pulling off to the side of the highway, too, on the edge of this hillside. And there, over the, the broad valley in the, in the green mountains, was the rainbow at night, in the middle of the night. It was the aurora borealis in an absolute arc. And that was our rainbow at night, when all things are darkest. There is still a promise of hope. And that's held us through many a difficult time in these years. Many a difficult time. <laughs>